Hello, and welcome to the session on trustworthy storage, where we're going to talk about expectations and reality. My name is Eric Kibberg, and as you can see, um, I'm a practicing security and privacy professional. Um, I've been involved in a wide range of international standardization activities, and relative to, to this talk, um, I was actually the ISO editor for the 27,040 storage security standard, and um, I lead the uh, U.S. national body activities to the ISO committee that deals with uh, cybersecurity and privacy standardization. I also do quite a bit of work with the American Bar Association, uh, which gives me a legal perspective on, on a variety of issues as well. Um, so with, uh, with that, I also should mention that uh, within the Storage Network Industry Association, I chair the Security Technical Work Group and have been involved in, in security-oriented activities with SNEA you know, since about 2004, so quite, uh, quite some time. So today's talk um, is probably a little different than in some of the other ones. My, my intention is to... Um, give you some background on uh, some areas in security to a lesser degree privacy that we're seeing emerge um, that I think ultimately will have an impact on uh, storage systems and storage ecosystems, but it may not be immediately obvious that that's the case. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about some concepts, some frameworks, if you will, that will, I think in many ways, drive uh, some of the future of security changes that that will occur in in uh, at the storage layer. Um, the the two that I'm going to focus on today are, are concept of trustworthiness, and the other one is zero trust. And I'm going to try and bring those back to how they're different than where we are today with storage security and uh, various other activities. All right. So obviously, I'm going to start with with trustworthiness. What is it? Um, and, and, and sort of issues, and then move to zero trust, which is a, a different kind of beast, and then looking at this through the lens of, of uh, securing storage. So first up, trustworthiness. Um, trustworthiness has, uh, at least for me, has an interesting history, and um, one of the things that, that emerged a while ago in the United States is uh, the Federal Trade Commission started paying attention to vendors who would make claims about the security or their, their product was secure. But if it turned out that, uh, in fact, there were vulnerabilities, which is inevitable, um, and they knew about it, but they didn't disclose that information, when that came to light, uh, there have been multiple instances where the FTC has basically filed um, deceptive practices uh, against those companies. And the fines can be pretty steep. It could be measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And equally important, you can be uh, supervised for up to 20 years. In other words, you're having to report back to the FTC on a regular basis of how you're dealing with whatever the particular the, you know, issue is. And in, in the case of you know, unfair and deceptive practices, uh, especially if it's aligned with security, that could be a problem. All right, so, so with that backdrop, uh, you know, as a practicing security professional, somebody who has operated in the, um, the arena of, of a, a storage vendor, uh, clearly I wanted to be careful about using the, you know, claims about secure uh, product. Um, so the word trustworthiness was, was actually something that, that was very appealing because at least from a dictionary definition, it doesn't necessarily mean security. Um, something could be trustworthy because the company is over 100 years old and it's been around, it's expected to be around in the future. Um, you know, it's dealt with its customer needs and things of that nature. But you notice I didn't say anything about, you know, the product is, is secure. Um, well, that was the backdrop for a while. But what we're seeing now is that ISO has recognized that this trustworthiness term is actually um, is interesting and can convey a whole bunch of concepts simultaneously, assuming you can actually get it defined. 
And so they've undertaken an effort to, to basically define trustworthiness. And the definition, the working definition, because this is a work in progress, currently is what you see. It's trustworthiness corresponds to the ability to meet stakeholders' expectations in a verifiable way. Um, I don't want to say it's content-free, but it's pretty much content-free. Um, what's worth noting is note two um, has a little more action. And in this instance, what they're highlighting is characteristics of trustworthiness include reliability, availability, resiliency, security, privacy, safety, accountability, transparency, integrity, authenticity, quality, usability, and accuracy. That's a tall order. And in fact, that's the focus of uh, the discussions within ISO. And they're looking at this as almost a cross-cutting concept, if you will, in that it's showing up in artificial intelligence, it's showing up in IoT, and, and it's even showing up in, in some of the security and privacy standardization activities. So I'm gonna to touch on um, some set of these, which I think are, are core and um, to, to varying degrees play into um, you know, needs within storage. So the first piece is, is safety. And um, although in, in, this is one of those that from a, from a storage perspective, um, we don't necessarily talk a whole lot about, um, it does come into play when you look at things like racks and whatnot. But from here, uh, it, it, the focus on physical injury and damage to the health of people and you know, whether that's directly or indirectly, and it includes environmental safety, living entity safety, and, and operational safety. Um, no, normally, it wouldn't be a big deal for us, but when you start looking at things like IoT, which are going to have interactions with, with storage systems, uh, things that happen in the IoT space can and will have an impact on, on, on humans. And so it's important to keep this in mind um, because failures or issues here could, uh, could replicate out to, to the, the safety side of the house. Security is obviously a, a, a no-brainer in this space, and especially for, for storage systems. Um, from, a, from an ISO perspective, they're looking at it both from an information and a systems perspective. And they're specifically looking at, at um, you know, integrity, availability, and confidentiality, the CIA from a security perspective. So if you operate in a space, no, no big surprise there. But the fact that they are looking at, at the information versus system um, you know, is important. Privacy is the next piece. Um, from, from a lot of the work that ISO is doing right now, the focus is actually fo on, on frameworks, laws, regulations. Um, there are dependencies on you know, from a privacy perspective on security and other facets, but uh, in, in a trustworthy perspective, it's really looking at, at sort of the more the, the legal and, and the privacy framework piece and security gets handled under the security moniker. The next piece that uh, I'd like to bring to your attention is resilience. Um, and, and the way it's described right now is kind of interesting. It's, it's you know, the system behaves in a manner to avoid, absorb, and manage dynamic adversarial conditions while completing the assigned missions and uh, reconstitute the operational capability after uh, casualties. In other words, this resilience means that, that the, the technology has the ability to um, adapt and bounce back. Um, as as part of of uh, what it does, and that's a that's a an interesting uh, concept. And of course, you can't do that in in isolation. You're going to have to factor in uh, you know the safety and the security and the privacy pieces in terms of how you go about doing this. The reliability, which in the storage world we're very very familiar with, it's basically uh, you know it's a set of conditions under which the system is tested to demonstrate that the functions perform for a specific period of time. In other words, it does what it's supposed to do within, you know, for example, five nines. And uh, a, a lot of what the storage industry has had to worry about is, you know, in that space. We, that's something that, that we, we know very well and have done uh, great things in that, that arena. Okay. So uh, sort of a visual view of, of these, and this is actually out of one of the, the ISO drafts. Um, it's showing that, 
that uh, what these attributes are and kind of the sub elements um, that exist. So, you know, security is a peer to, to safety, which is a peer to privacy, which is a peer to, you know, reliability and, and then resiliency. And there are these sub elements that, uh, um, you know, you potentially have to have to worry about. And this is what they're looking at. Um, and I think from, from a high level, uh, you know, this is something that um, going forward as, a, as an industry, storage is really going to need to pay attention to um, this, this cross-section. There are other components, but these are going to be, I think, the heart and soul uh, in, in the future. Um, I apologize for, for this diagram, but um, its intention is to show you um, that sort of the thought processes that's going on. So if you look at the very bottom, you see confidentiality, integrity, and availability um, you know, at the bottom. And, um, and, and the way the diagram is set up is it's showing that those are a factor of security. Um, and then from security, you see there are these connections to, to safety and reliability and privacy and resilience. And if you, if you were to look at the, the wording there, um, it supports. So to uh, achieve the other elements, security is, is, is identified as a component of that. And likewise, you see that um, safety also um, supports uh, security. And it's the combination of, of, of all of these and the interdependencies, the interplay, um, that um, in totality really make up trust. So trust is derived from all of these um, coexisting in a, in a way that has a, an overall sort of positive effect on, on whatever it is that you're talking about the trustworthiness of. Um, so this is significant because you're no longer looking at these as sort of individual components. You're no longer looking at reliability as just reliability. Now you have to look at reliability um, and at the same time, you know, for example, privacy. So is there something that when you deal with the privacy piece, it has, a, has an impact on, on, on reliability? Uh, and the answer, we, we already know, for example, with, with the at-rest encryption, um, there have been instances where at-rest encryption can actually cause reliability and resilience problems. Uh, just because of, of the very nature of, of that technology. But this is where ISO is currently thinking about this, and you should expect that, that in the future, the, the trustworthy conversation is going to be something that you're probably going to have to talk to, and it's all these elements, and you're going to have to essentially describe the interdependencies and the interactions of, of these components in, uh, in your systems and your designs. Okay, so what are the processes to promote trustworthiness? And these are above and beyond um, those that you are probably already familiar with from, from a you know, storage security perspective. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but to give you an idea that, that in some cases they're building upon or they have dependencies on things that you're already doing, and, um, but it, it may in some cases take it to another level. You may already be doing some of these, and that's great. But uh, again, this is from a um, sort of a totality picture. It's like you don't get to pick, you know, one or two of these. The expectation is that you're addressing most or all of these, and that's that. That again is um, a bit different than than I think where we are today. So the first up is basically dealing with configuration management. And again, looking at configuration management from from you know information assets and physical assets. So this is looking at, you know, for example, configuration management on the system itself, and then what are the configuration management things that are there to do with, for example, data. Um, this next one is re reproducibility of, of the build process. So um, when you have a product, can you get to a known um, secure state in in that build process and that's if you think about that that's important because that means a product before it goes out the door 
you've already dealt with the security posture issues. In other words, you've, you've installed all the software that has the security functionality and it's configured correctly. It's configured secure by default. It's, con it's configured for privacy by default and by design. Um, and you wanna be able to do that in a way where it's reproducible. In other words, you can get to that known state. This becomes an important issue if you're, um, if you're doing anything around security certification, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so the secure development process, I mean, are your engineering teams thinking about the concept of risk? Is this factored into the decisions they're making, uh, both short-term and long-term? So the viability of the product may be somewhat dependent on the, the ability to maintain uh, the security posture of that product. And if you made some poor choices in terms of selecting particular code or certain protocols, um, you're kind of asking for, for, for trouble. And, uh, but a lot of engineering teams are, are uh, not thinking that far ahead. And from a trustworthiness standpoint, it's absolutely critical that, uh, that this, the development process factors in the, the security elements. The next two, security response, secure response, and incident response, these are, are things around how do you deal with the, the active changes in the threat landscape? Do you recognize when you've got a problem? And, and when you do recognize you've got a problem, um, do you have the mechanisms and processes in place that let you uh, deal with it? And um, as opposed to having a customer come in and beat you about the head and shoulders, and then you respond to it. Are you doing things proactive? Are you monitoring, for example, the National Vulnerability Database and recognizing almost instantly when something comes in that, oh, that applies to me. Oh, I'm gonna go take care of this. Those are the kinds of things. And of course, embedded in this is how do you deal with the disclosure piece? And that's a, that's a fairly important aspect of this as well. Systems management and security management processes. Um, you know, this is something that uh, storage management is, has long been a concern of the storage industry. But now what we're talking about is how do you manage the, uh, the hardening of the systems and how do you deal with the managing the security aspects of this stuff? Uh, and, and those all have to be, you know, factored in and clean. Let me give you an example. Transport layer security or TLS is typically a pretty important component of storage management. Okay, most storage products actually have some, some sort of TLS support. The bigger question is, does that support include the ability to configure the TLS to the point of where you can exclude certain protocols, uh, user protocols, certain cipher suites, certain crypto, and the customer can do that? That is not so common, and that's, that's an, an aspect of, of this. Next up is supply chain processes. So making sure that authenticity and integrity issues are basically dealt with. Um, in particular, there's a lot of concern about counterfeit components being placed in the systems and, and what, the, what, you know, what does that actually you know, entail. Uh, obviously, the next to last one is dealing with uh, international industry standards. So if you're going to, to talk about trustworthiness and security, um, what's the basis for that? Uh, did you just like make it up? How, how does it, uh, you know, if you talk to lawyers, they'll talk about reasonable security, but what constitutes reasonable security? So do you have a leg to stand on and you say, oh, well, we've, you know, we've, we've developed against best practices. Well, in the security world, that actually means, you know, you're using a particular security framework as the basis. You can't just, you know, make it up. They're going to, uh, customers in particular, um, may, may actually demand adherence to particular security frameworks. So you may have to be able to, you used one, they're expecting something else. You may have to be able to do the crosswalk between those. The last element sort of gave you a teaser to its evaluation. Uh, third parties, basically accreditation. This is where crypto, for for example, against FIPS 140 certification, um, could be common criteria. In fact, uh, uh, just this week we had an ISO SC27 meeting, uh, which deals with uh, 
information security, cybersecurity, and privacy standardization. And uh, there's some discussions underway as to whether you can do common criteria with regard to cloud. So there's lots of lots of interesting things happening in, in this arena. Okay, so what kind of protections are needed for trustworthiness? Uh, then I'll go through these fairly quickly, but but basically it's protection from. So you know, security. We we always look at the the underbelly. You know, what 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 we're trying to guard against. So unauthorized disclosure. So this really plays into the to the privacy space, but it also, if you have credentials that are being exposed, this you know can can un seriously undermine the you know the security of a of a system, at least the, the posture. Um, protection against modification. This is a, a fairly important concept. If you look at a lot of the privacy laws that have been implemented, in particular the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, they've defined data breach in a way that um, corruption or destruction of data constitutes a data breach and, and essentially invokes all of the trials and tribulations around um, what GDPR is getting at. And, and so that simple sort of redefining has a pretty major impact because in the past, um, storage engineers going out and doing updates on firmware and whatnot might not have ever been a party to a data breach. Now, if your personnel go out and do an update and that firmware has an issue or the process that's used has an issue and results in, in, in data corruption, you could have just bought the farm in terms of having a caused a data breach and you know for your customer and clearly your customer is going to want to share. Um, so uh, so so the modification and then then this temporary or permanent loss both sort of play into into that uh, arena. So again that's that's about the availability piece as well. So loss of confidence in the in the information asset. This is kind of back to this whole trustworthy thing. If you've got a, uh, you know, if you've got a vulnerability that you basically tell the customer, we're not going to do anything about this. Uh, you know, as somebody who's run data centers in the past, I can pretty much guarantee if you told me that as a data center manager, I'll be looking at your competition. So how you respond to to this threat landscape and and you respond to the concerns of your customer base is going to be a huge, huge issue, and um, and it requires some upfront thinking in terms of how you're going to how you're going to deal with it. This last point is the protection from interference. So this is where you're you're worrying about how do you sufficiently isolate, and isolation could be, you know, if you think about multi-tenancy or secure multi-tenancy, how the tenants aren't basically causing each other difficulty. Um, but it could be how um, you know your 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 cloud uh, versus your your in-house you know your your on-site activities are interacting or not interacting how they're how they're isolated. So this concept of isolation um, can be fairly important. That the example I like to use is the secure multi-tenancy. Um, you know what what exactly is that and and have you. Uh, how do you deal with that? And we'll talk a little more about that later. Okay, so there's some controlling aspects of capabilities and trustworthiness that you've got to worry about, right? So one of those is how you do the control over error reporting and diagnostics. Um, and, and this is fairly important because uh, this dealing with these may actually give you clues um, that you're under attack. So part of this is health and fault monitoring, but in some cases the attacks uh, will sort of first sign of a problem might be that you're getting some sort of error reporting. Uh, case in point, you may be under under attack with ransomware, and uh, you know certain s system files may have been encrypted, which means the system starts generating um, errors and warnings. Um, and if you're monitoring that, then you have a heads up that you've got a problem. Well, why is that important? Well, a lot of this malware is actually geared to basically take out your entire ecosystem, not just one system. So if you, you respond fairly quickly to that one system, you may be able to save uh, major chunks of your infrastructure. 
So again, this is back to looking at sort of an ecosystem perspective as opposed to sort of you know, individuals. The next is control over real-time protection capabilities. And, and I'm gonna talk more about this with, with Zero Trust because this is literally, um, you know, it's not a one and done kind of thing. This is uh, you're having to adapt uh, to what we call zero day events. You may not have a whole lot of information. Uh, you may be changing what individual users or, or systems are allowed to do or interact with. And being able to deal with those real time is absolutely you know, uh, an issue today and becoming even more important. Um, the third one, dealing with key escrow capabilities. This plays into to the encryption arena. But do keep in mind that um, you know, if you lose your data encryption keys, uh, you basically lost the data. And so what, what steps have you taken to, to basically deal with that? And this is particularly important when you look at, at uh, disaster recovery business continuity scenarios, depending on where your encryption is actually taking place. Um, you, know, you might have successfully replicated all the data to, to another data center and you're ready to go, except that what you replicated was ciphertext. In other words, everything's encrypted, and you forgot to basically make sure that the, the encryption mechanism, but more importantly, the keys are over there that you can use those. So again, this is a sort of the holistic view on things. And then last but not least is having the ability to, to essentially um, make changes to especially some of the security features. Again, responding to that threat landscape. So do you have the ability to you know, rip out you know, TLS 1.2 and replace it with TLS 1.3 without gutting the product or basically obsoleting the current product? And so how you approach this, especially from sort of a modular perspective, uh, whether you're, you're adding functionality or, or getting rid of functionality, um, you know, is, is actually a, a big concern in, in trustworthiness space. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears a bit here and talk about uh, zero trust. Um, so what is it? So it's, it's basically a collection of concepts and ideas. Um, you're, you're, you're minimizing uh, what they call uncertainty here, but essentially you're trying to enforce accurate, least privileged per request access decisions. Think about what I just said. That means every time you do something, you're, you're doing it in a way where you have the bare minimum privilege, just enough privilege to let you do that. And it's being enforced and it's always accurate. So if there's a, a real time change, that's reflected instantaneously. Um, and this is all done um, in, in an environment where the network is basically assumed to be compromised, fully untrusted. Um, that's a that's a pretty tall order, and that's basically what zero trust is is trying to do. If you haven't seen uh, the new NIST special publication 80207, um, this is the NIST zero trust architecture, basically, and, and it's an interesting read. It's also free, um, so if you're if you're looking for a, a source to look at, I, I would definitely recommend taking a peek at it. Right, and and. So what are some of the tenets of zero trust? Uh, and again, remember this, what I'm going to describe here, it's, it's not just one of these that you do, it's you're looking at all of these simultaneously. And that's, that's where the difficulty comes into play. Okay, so everything is treated, you know, so, so all data sources and computing services, they're considered resources. So everything is looked at from a resource perspective. So in every interaction with these resources, um, it's essentially a, a lot of what the rest of the zero trust is about. Um, all communications is secure. It doesn't matter where it is. It, it can be inside of a storage system, for example. And the expectation is if you have a communication between you know, like a disk controller and a drive, that you're securing that communication. There's no trust anywhere, right? Or, or said another way, trust but verify which is you know, sort of a, a security mantra, what you're seeing is zero trust. It really is zero trust. Um, assume everything is hostile. Um, everything from an enterprise resource perspective, 
it's it, access is granted on a per session basis. So every time you reach out to get something, uh, you know, you the, a whole set of verifications and authentication uh, are are performed before you're given access to it, and and the uh, and that can take on lots of different sort of uh, so you may be always allowed to get at something, but the time of day or your location may dictate whether you get at it or to the degree that you can actually use the resource. All right, so continuing with these, these tenants, um, th there's a policy that's, that sits behind all of this and it's intended to be, that policy is intended to be very dynamic. So if somebody's terminated, for example, from within the company, then um, that's reflected in the infrastructure and it immediately is factored into policy decisions. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's, it's you know, who you are, um, it, it can be based on the application you run, it could actually be, be different based on whether you, you use your, your mobile device or your laptop could, could determine what you have access to, could be where you're, you know, where in the world that you're sitting at the, any given time. Um, and there may be some other behavioral uh, things that are that are going on. So, if you haven't used uh, multi-factor or two-factor authentication, um, just by virtue of doing that, there may be restrictions on what you're uh, permitted to do. All of this is basically codified in policy, and then based on what happens, you know, will determine what and how you can access things. And of course, there's there's monitoring measures, you know, for, for the integrity and security posture of, of you know, the, the assets. So think about this, when your laptop, you initially go to connect, um, part of the process may be to do a quick scan of your system to determine whether it's uh, become vulnerable since the last time it connected. And in fact, if it has been affected with some malware, uh, connection may be refused or, or it may be diminished. So again, this is a, a, a back to that, you know, trust but verify. So is the client affected in a way that if it connects that it could basically infect, um, you know, the infrastructure? If the answer is yes, you don't get to connect. Um, so all resources are authenticated and authorization and it's all done dynamically and it's strictly enforced. So again, least privilege, uh, you know, root and admin, forget about it, doesn't exist uh, with these kinds of accesses. You literally only get access to what you really truly need to have access to. Um, as part of this process, you've got to have a lot of information on the assets and the resources um, and, and how they're interconnected and the security posture because all of this factors into how you execute the, the, the policies and whatnot that are, that are being used. Um, so you've heard me talk a little bit about you know the networking. So, but it's, this is sort of at the heart and soul of zero trust. Um, it's it basically there is no trust, um, and there is no implicit trust zone. So there's not an inside network and an outside network. It's all outside network, and even within a system, it may be an outside network, and that's that's kind of core to to uh, you know the the zero trust mentality. As you're probably guessing. This is not trivial to implement, and this is this is a fundamental change in in uh, you know how organizations uh, structure their infrastructure and their networks if they go down this path, right? Um, part of the reason for for going down this path is increasingly we're seeing that um, devices that are on a network, even if it's like your your local area network, they may not be owned or even configurable by the enterprise. It may be there by a third party, and there may be problems with with those devices, and um, so there, you know, that that's and we're seeing increasingly a lot of data breaches that occur is because you've got, you know, your supply chain isn't doing what they need to be doing. Well, zero trust basically, you know, factors that in that yeah, that they, they probably didn't do what they should be doing. Um, so no resource is inherently trusted. Um, so anytime a resource needs to interact with another resource, your laptop with, you know, uh, an email server, for example, there's no, there's no assumed trust there. It's all basically got to be established using security mechanisms. Um, and again, back to this ownership issue, 
you know, not all resources are on enterprise owned infrastructure. Cloud is the easy example here. So especially you could be running in a hybrid cloud kind of scenario, zero trust absolutely factors that in. It, it, it's assuming that you may be using assets that you have no ownership for and it, it, uh, it factors that into, into the equation, so to speak. Um, so remote enterprise uh, subjects and assets can't fully trust their local network connection. You know, I've said this multiple times. So it's it's you know you, you, it, it's it's a it's a different perspective because if many security professionals will tell you, for example, don't connect to to hotel Wi-Fi. Well, in a zero trust scenario, everything's assumed to be as bad as the hotel Wi-Fi. So it doesn't matter where you're at, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, so it really does fundamentally change the game, but it does mean you've got to make a lot of changes to your systems and infrastructure. Um, and, you know, the assets and workflows moving between enterprise and non-enterprise infrastructure, um, there's really a need for consistent security policy and posture. So that the security posture is something that is, that is basically tested on on a, on a regular basis. So if you've got you know, a, a third party that's in your infrastructure or participating in that, you know, there's gonna be a desire to basically understand um, what their policies are and the postures. And if they don't align well, then again, that's gonna affect what you can do. Okay, so lots of, you know, sort of interesting concepts. So how does this, you know, materialize? You know, this is a this is a, a nice little diagram, but you see kind of at the at the heart of it, and that's just to the right of the little black box that says system. You've got a policy enforcement point. So this policy enforcement is um, is core to how zero trust uh, works. It's making decisions based on a whole bunch of different things, um, and you know the, the the policy engine, if you will. Is uh, is making real time changes, which is basically uh, updating the enforcement point, um, and and then it's taking information based on on you know your system, you as a user, you know your uh, a variety of other issues before it it, it uh, essentially lets you in. Um, to do all this, though, it requires that you've got a, a wide range of technologies that are basically being used. So you know, you've got data access policies and, and uh, endpoint you know, protections. Uh, you, you probably have some sort of a public key infrastructure, ID management and scene systems that are all sort of plugged in here. Um, and on the other side, you know, why, why are you doing this? Well, you're trying to deal with uh, you know, accountability and traceability, uh, you know, the, the, the threat landscape. So any sort of threat intelligence you've got, you know, compliance and, and, and what. You know, the key thing to, to, to think about is this policy, policy engine. It's getting real-time inputs from a bunch of external sources, and it's dealing with those real-time. And that's, um, that's a pretty big change from, from how we, uh, we see a lot of the infrastructure going. So there are a bunch of different deployment models that you can use for zero trust. These are three examples that, that I thought would be kind of interesting. So that the top left, um, think of this as you've got a laptop that's got a, basically an agent that, that's going to ultimately talk to a gateway that's going to then wrap, if you will, some sort of uh, data resource. Okay. However, the importance of this is that your your laptop is not going to be able to actually have any kind of dialogue with that resource until it's been duly authorized. In fact, you, you might not even know how to reach it. And even if you could, if you knew the IP address of that resource, it's not going to respond to you at all. So you can't like do a denial of service attack against it because it will absolutely drop the packets at the lowest sort of network level um, until it basically is told, yeah, you can talk to him. And so there's a process that, that, that's typically involved in terms of how, how even that initial connection gets set up. So, so this is where you can, you can actually do computing in very unsafe environments. And, and the bad guys, you know, if they're scanning your, your, your network, they're not even going to see these resources. They just disappear. In fact, I've had some security guys grumble because when they go to try and 
scan, do security scans against uh, the infrastructure that's being protected this way, they can't see it. So they can't even determine whether, whether it's got vulnerabilities or not. And, and they, they, they ask to have the, uh, the shields drop so they can do the verification, which you know, always gives me kind of a chuckle. The, uh, you know, the, the, the next model, which is kind of similar you know, on the upper right-hand side, think of this same kind of dance where you've got a you've got maybe a laptop with an agent running there that's interacting with you know the policy engines and whatnot but then it's talking with a gateway that if it gets through the gateway is then going to give you access to a whole bunch of, of services this could be like in your dmz so you could be your mail and calendaring and a bunch of different services so you can bundle up a bunch of stuff that sits behind one of these gateways so you could do it, you know, on a on a service by service basis, or you could actually do it so it's like a bunch of stuff that's in a cul de sac. Um, yeah, some some options in terms of putting gate, you know, the the agents on on uh, whatever the endpoint device is, it, it might not be an option. And so then there are other models that basically allow you to, to have essentially a vanilla system that then is talking with uh, a gateway uh, portal. And this little dance in terms of you know policies and identification and authentication, everything else is done against the portal. And if you get through that, then you get out to the resource. Again, the, the resource itself um, isn't visible, and the portal itself might not respond to um, any sort of interactions unless, unless it's from a policy perspective, knows that it's allowed to talk to uh, to your device. And if your device has problems, then um, it, that, you know the, the, the portal might actually reach out and say, "Oh, here's a little agent. You need to go run this to, to check and see if you know you've got any uh, any malware running." Okay, so let's talk a little bit about implications and challenges that that these two trustworthiness and and zero trust might introduce for um, for storage. All right, so. Sort of a recap on some things that you know I've already mentioned. Um, you know, privacy regulations have really, really re, you know, redefined data breaches, and, um, and and it's affecting storage systems and, and vendors in this space. It's showing up in contracts. Uh, it's showing up in in how the systems are being connected, and so it's important that you're you're aware of this because this is this is a driver in terms of why organizations are are going to adopt some of these uh, these approaches. Um, the attacks, and in particular ransomware, um, is, is a scourge that has lots and lots of enterprises very, very concerned. They're being explicitly targeted. The bottom line is the bad guys have figured out that um, you know it's actually easier to basically deny your access to data than to actually move it off and try and monetize it by you know stealing credit cards and things like that. It's just easier to, uh, to hold it ransom and Storage is well. It's the bucket holding the bits, and if uh, you know if it gets hit, or if the systems that are using the storage get hit, um, you know the, the storage systems are caught up in this in you know, one way or another. You know, as I said, there there is this deparameterization of enterprise networks. It's pretty much understood that firewalls are a little more than a speed bump, uh, especially when you factor in that you've got Wi-Fi and you've got mobile devices and bring your own devices that are. That are being used. There are many, many entries into into the enterprise networks, and and so there's um, anybody that's assuming that they've got a hard, impenetrable, crunchy shell on the outside, and that's going to do it for them. But they won't last long in a, in a security position if that's sort of sort of their perspective. Um, the last item is dealing with all right. So you put data on storage media, and uh, it turns out it can be fairly difficult to get rid of it. Um, and it's becoming an issue because there's a desire to essentially reuse technology. We've seen, for example, in Europe that there's a, uh, a regulation that uh, is requiring some specific technology um, when, when you have storage systems of a certain kind uh, to encourage reuse. And uh, uh, we don't expect that that's going to be a unique situation. We think that uh, you know, reuse, you know, green storage, green servers, green something. Uh, it is going to be important, and it's not just about power consumption. Uh, so media absolutely plays into that, and of course, that's where you know storage you know lives. Um, 
when I talk about storage security, or at least contemporary storage security, and you know, there are some specific things that come to mind. Um, none of these should be shockers. Most of this is defined in the ISO storage security standard. Um, so it's basically system and network hardening, you know, basic security, um, dealing with the storage management, making sure that that you know it's secured that because it's privileged users that those privileged users you know have uh, you know sufficient restrictions on what they do because they could be very damaging. Accountability and traceability is part of that. Um, Dealing with uh, data access, how do you do this in a secure way? At a bare minimum, if you've got some level of authentication going on, um, maybe more if you can, you, can, you can swing it. Encryption and key management, especially data at rest encryption, uh, uh, is pretty much assumed to be a requirement for multiple, uh, multiple sectors. Likewise, media sanitization, we were just talking a little bit about this. How do you make, how do you make data go away, especially sensitive data? Uh, and then the last piece here is, is leveraging the security infrastructure. This is the customer infrastructure. So you've got to have the ability to plug in using some of these protocols um, that, that, you know, some of them are fairly ancient, others are, are fairly new. But doing it in a way where you're not forcing the customer to change their infrastructure to accommodate you, you have to basically fit into whatever it is they've done. Um, so sort of if you move up a little bit, what do I mean by you know advanced storage security? So these are things that maybe less common or are where the, the the contemporary are pretty much ubiquitous. These you may have sort of bits and pieces. So um, storage link encryption. So if you're familiar with fiber channel security protocol, you maybe have implemented you know the encryption um, you know over over the connection between the the host bus adapter and um, and the actual storage array, for example. Um, secure autonomous data movement. Um, the concept behind this really came out of uh, information lifecycle management. But think of this as, as you may be um, autonomously moving data around uh, to, to deal with, you know, something, a piece of, of data is just not used very much. And you're trying to maximize your expensive storage. And so you're moving behind the scenes, data between different tiers of storage, right? So tiered storage may be a concept you're familiar with. Well, every time you move this data, you leave a data dropping. And over time, it may go away, depending on, on the system. This concept means you proactively manage that. You park a piece of data somewhere and you no longer need it, you make sure you get rid of it. Um, another facet of it is, have you moved data into um, technology that may or may not be appropriate for the sensitivity of the data. If you have a storage system sitting in a broom closet, you clearly don't want uh, you know, the recipe for Coca-Cola showing up there where somebody could basically easily steal it. You're gonna want that to stay in you know, the most secure data center with you know, maximum protections. So uh, how you deal with that um, is, is what's bundled in here. Secure multi-tenancy, um, as opposed to multi-tenancy, this is dealing with, you know, um, the individual tenants aren't impacting each other. In fact, they don't even know uh, that they exist. Sort of the comparison is that you could have seven tenants in a secure multi-tenancy environment. From their perspective, it should be identical to running on dedicated uh, hardware or systems for each one of them. That's, that's sort of the, the ultimate test, how close you get to that. One of the attributes of this that, that's a little different from multi-tenancy is if you've got seven tenants, they could all be, they could be competitors and you would actually have to plug into seven different um, security infrastructures to deal with, with the seven tenants. And um, so that's a little different view than, than uh, multi-tenancy, which might actually have a common uh, security infrastructure. So it's just a couple of examples. Long-term retention and preservation. Um, think immutability and what does that mean? And, and uh, again, how do you protect it? And then when you no longer protect it, how do you make it go away? These are all kinds of issues. Uh, Long-term is longer than 10 years. So what kind of media are you using? How, how are you ensuring that you don't have bit rot that gets replicated over time? How do you detect that? How do you deal with you know, encryption where you've got to change algorithms you know, in 20 years? How do you deal with a situation where 
none of the data owners are currently alive, but you, you may need to get access at some point, things of that nature. Next one is software-defined whatever, software-defined storage, software-defined protection, uh, software-defined networking. What are the security implications and issues around us? Um, you know, we're beginning to see activities in this space. Software-defined uh, protection, Cloud Security Alliance has been doing work in, in that space for quite a while. And it actually turns out to be a subset of Zero Trust, which is, you know, interesting. Um, and cloud storage and dealing with sort of hybrid scenarios with cloud storage or, or what about multi-cloud uh, kinds of scenarios? Again, these are, are, are new areas that are being discussed by cloud service providers and customers to a certain degree. The security implications on these change. I think preservation, uh, federation. Okay, so, so coming back to trustworthiness, what are the kinds of things that you need to worry about? Um, well, you have ecosystem hardening. This is not just system hardening. You have identity and access management and federation. Um, so this is not just simple authentication and authorization. This is you know much broader context. Um, dynamic access control with constraints. Think of maker checker. So you've got two people that, that have the same access, but it takes two of them in operating in different uh, capacities. It's kind of like launching a missile where it requires two guys, each with their own key, turning the key at exactly the right time, and neither one of them can turn both keys at the same time. Um, Tamper-proof, so mechanisms that guard against um, you know, systems being changed, so, so this is you, you know, hardware roots of trust that, that help you guard against malware. Um, but it may be you know, immutability uh, and things of that nature that come, you know, come into play. Isolation and sandboxing, doing this in such a way that you know, it, it may actually involve security kernels. So you know, for example, all IO is, is actually um, controlled with true security mechanisms. Um, real time, it, it comes up over and over again. It's, it's not, you know, well, when I booted up you know, six weeks ago, you know, this was what I worried about. It's how do you protect yourself real time against malware, whether that's, that's um, changing signatures from your, your antivirus software to recognizing uh, zero day events um, because you see some anomalous behavior and, and you know what your known good behavior is. Um, you absolutely want to exploit all the protections that, that um, you have at your disposal uh, and, and that they are uh, sort of optimally configured at all times. And then monitoring plays into this on a regular basis. And monitoring is not just logging. Monitoring is you're taking logs and, you're, and, and they're actionable. All right. So you're looking at regular operations. This is how you know, am I doing something that I normally do or is this anomalous? And then the other piece is from a forensic perspective. So we actually had an incident. Do I have enough information that I can go back and figure out what happened and who did it and, and things of that nature? So some final thoughts on, on all of this. You know, clearly adversaries are, are changing their tax at a rapid pace. Um, you know, this has definitely been the case. It, it, the pace is quickening. Um, and as a defender, uh, you have to be nimble. Storage from a security perspective has not been nimble, and that's a change that, that you should absolutely expect and you know, hopefully you embrace. Um, data is today's currency, and um, storage kind of lives in that space. So you're on the line of fire. Uh, it, it's just, just a fact of life. Uh, and I think the ransomware view has really, I think, been a wake-up call for a lot of organizations because, well, it's it's actually more valuable to the bad guys to deprive you of access than to like use it themselves. And that trend is not going to go away. And last but not least, um, we've got lots of emerging technologies, 5G, IoT, artificial intelligence, blockchain, the list goes on and on. Um, many of these are going to basically add new requirements and dependencies for storage. Um, and in particular, I look at 5G and IoT, that combination just seems to be a, a forcing function on how we think about storage. You know, is it going to be all in the data center or is it gonna be out on the edge? 
well, time will tell, but you know, early indications are it's probably both. Um, and so the security implications on that become pretty important, uh, especially when you think about you know what I was talking about in zero trust. So I'd like to thank you for your time today, and um, I hope that uh, you found some of this useful. The intention was to to give you some insights into uh, some some somewhat edgy parts of what we're seeing in the security world. Uh, a lot of this is not uh, easy to implement, and it's going to require some forethought and some some time to basically deal with it. If you liked the session, or or if you didn't, we uh, absolutely would love to have your feedback. Um, and uh, so please take time to, to rate the session. And with that, thank you again, uh, and, and I hope this was uh, of value to, to you.